we are continuing our study of the fundamentals of our faith. And for a few weeks here, we are focusing on the fundamental truths of who God is and what he's like. And for all of us, our identity is made up of many different things. We have things that are true of us individually. You might be tall or studious. Maybe you're Jewish or American. And those are things that describe who you are. We also have identity that is relational. Maybe you're a mother or you're a boss or you're a neighbor or you're a nephew. And what's interesting is that those require somebody else. That is a relational identity that you don't have unless there's somebody else that you relate to in that way. And God reveals himself with both individual identity and relational identity. Individually, he's holy, he's eternal, he is perfect. And he also reveals himself relationally as our father. That, that is quite a concept. Just that he would reveal himself relationally. He is transcendent. He does not need to give an identity of himself that has anything to do with anyone else. He could be totally separate, totally distant, but part of who God is, is how he relates to others. And he reveals himself not just at, in general as relational, he reveals himself as father. He's not our heavenly uncle, our heavenly grandma, our heavenly cousin. He's our heavenly father. That is one of the most important relationships you can have, the relationship of father and child. There are some crazy statistics about how significant the father-child relationship is. And it's a sensitive word for us, father, because every one of us has a different relationship with our earthly father. And those relationships bring out a lot of emotion because they have shaped us. There are fathers that we've lost and we miss our father. Some of us, when we think of father, think of fathers who've hurt us and fathers who gave us insecurities. There's others who think of father and they just want to be like their father because he was such a, a shining example of, of the type of person they want to be. So every one of us has a different emotion when we think of father, but it's a tender, very intimate thought because our father is someone so significant to who we are. And God has not just revealed himself in general as someone who relates to us, he has revealed himself in one of the most tender, significant of all relationships as our father. And so as we begin this message, I invite you to pray with me that we would be able to learn from our father. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what an awesome thought to know that you really are our father. We are your children and we want to know more of you as our father. I pray as we open your word, if you would help us to see you specifically in the way that you love us as Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, our third fundamental belief is our belief of the Father. And this is what it says. God, the eternal Father, is the creator, source, sustainer, and sovereign of all creation. He is just and holy, merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The qualities and powers exhibited in the Son and the Holy Spirit are also those seen in the Father. So we cannot cover the whole scope of what it means that God is our Father with three sentences, but there's a summary of our belief in God as Father. And today we are not going to cover it all either. We're going to look at just a narrow slice of who God is as Father. And we're going to get that from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. So just three verses that help us to see this view of God as our Father. I wonder if John had a special relationship with his Father that helped him to see who God is as Father. We know, um, we know that John had a father that he, he knew. He, we know who he is. His name is Zebedee. And we also know that he worked with his father. They were fishermen together. We know that he left his father in the boat to follow Jesus. So there's, 
this experience John has had of leaving his earthly father that he loved to follow after God. And we also know that John was given a nickname. He was one of the sons of thunder. So he was actually given a name. People referred to him in his relational connection to a father. You are the son of thunder. And I wonder if that shaped his view of God as father because John, more than any other Bible writer, refers to God as father. When you take the gospel of John and in the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, more references to God as Father than any other books of the Bible. And so here again, he refers to God as Father and he says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. I memorized that in a different translation and it said, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And I like those words better. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. There is a sense of greatness and awe when we think of fathers. My kids think I can do anything. There's no one who thinks higher of my ability than my kids. And they're young, and one day they'll learn I can't do anything. But I think that it's more than ignorance that causes a child to view their father as great. Of course, there's this child ignorance, but I think also that God put into the heart of a child, an admiration. They look up to their father in a way to help us understand the greatness of who God is. And so John exclaims, how great is this love? That's the type of language that expresses how a child thinks about their father. I'm gonna highlight three points of the father from this text. The first is the attributes of the father. And we see in this first verse, that he is love. See what kind of love the Father has given us. And we see that he gives. Now when we talk about the attributes of the Father, we are not saying that those are distinct from the Son or the Spirit. It is not that God is love and Jesus is not. And we sing about this, that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus is love too. And then that that third sentence of our fundamental belief, it said that the qualities and powers exhibited in the Son and the Holy Spirit are also those of the Father. So these attributes are not separate from the Son and Spirit, but they are especially seen in the Father. We have a special kind of fatherly love that we see in God and a generous giving that we see from God. So let's think about this love. The Bible says that God is love in this, ver- in this book, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God is love. That refers to all of them, but to the Father in, in particular. John, who writes much about the Father, chapter 16, verse 26 and 27, says this. I love this picture of the Father. It says, I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. So this is Jesus talking. And he says, I could ask the Father, but the Father himself loves you. This is an important picture of the Father because sometimes we think of the Son as the cuddly part of God. But in that, that God is this, the Father is this stern judge and that Jesus is the go-between. And it's true, there's only one way to the Father and it's through the Son. So he is our mediator, but it's not because the Father doesn't love. The Father himself loves you. It's important for the child to know that the father doesn't have to be filtered. He loves his children. In the story of the prodigal son, we see a father who has reckless, awesome love for his son. He runs after him. This is the heart of the father. He is love. And that love leads him to give. We see this in John 3.16. Here here again is John teaching us of who the Father is. And he says, God so loved the world that he gave. What did love motivate the Father to do? Give. We see in John chapter 3, verse 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Love led him to give. James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of heavenly lights. And so it is the Father's heart that gives. I love how Luke says it, Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, 
for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He gives and he doesn't do it with anger and resentment. He delights to give to his children. Matthew 7, 11, that's a convenient reference. Matthew 7, 11, if then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So God is the Father, is love, and his heart is to give. And just a few more attributes. We can't exhaust the attributes of the Father, but I went through every verse in the Bible. I opened up a concordance this week and looked up Father, and I went through every verse in the Bible that has the word Father in it. And we see many places where it's just in the Chronicles. So-and-so is the Father of so-and-so. But then we see parts of verses about the Father that teach us something about who God is. And we see some comparisons between earthly fathers and our heavenly father. For example, in Psalms 103, 13, we see that just as an earthly father has compassion on his child, our heavenly father has compassion. In Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, we see that just as an earthly father disciplines his child that he loves, our heavenly father disciplines us. But we really start to see father being used in the New Testament, especially in the words of Jesus. He refers to God as father many times. So we see some attributes in Matthew chapter 5, 48. Jesus says, um, Therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Our Father is perfect. We see in Matthew 6 multiple times that our God sees what is done in secret. He says, When you pray, uh, go into your closet, pray in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now that teaches us something important about the Father. He sees the things in secret. That means he's tuned in. He's aware. He knows what's going on in the hearts of his children. He's not aloof and distant, but the things that you don't want to share with anyone else, that you don't want to be exposed, he's aware of those things. He sees those things. He has an intimate relationship and connection with what's going on in your life. That's a good father. It says in the same chapter, Matthew 6, 14, the Lord's Prayer tells us, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. Later on, it's talking about worry. It's talking about the birds that you can hear right now. And he says, your Father in heaven feeds them. So this is a, an essential, like a fundamental role of a father is to provide for his children. And God, our Father, is a provider. He cares for his creation. He feeds the birds. And it continues and says, you know, you're worried about many things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Once again, he has a knowledge of his children. And one of my favorite attributes here is John 14. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'll come back. And when he says that, he says, in my Father's house are many rooms. What is he saying? He's saying that he has planned for guests. He is inviting people. He has space. There is room with the Father for you to come. In his house are many rooms. And so we see a heart of the Father who wants us to come to him, who has a place for us of belonging. And so the second point I want to look at is that there are children of the Father. And we see that in the verse it says, what kind of love the Father, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. So what is significant that, that we are the children of the Father? Now, there is a really logical process here of how a man becomes a father. If, if there's a, a husband and wife and the wife walks into the room and says, you're going to be a father. She's not making an announcement about the man so much. Nothing has changed about the man. She's making announcement about the little baby that is growing inside of her. When she says, you're going to be a father, what she's saying is, there's a child. So the man might boast and say, I made the child. But it's really the child that made the man into a father. You can't be a father without a child. You can be a man without a child. But to be a father, you have to have a child. And so here's how God has revealed himself to us as father. Now, we don't want to get this wrong. 
we are totally dependent on God and not the other way around. He's not dependent on us. But in his identity as father, that depends on having a child. And God has taken on this identity re- relationally to us where he, that very identity of father depends on the fact that we are his children. What an awesome privilege to be a child of God. There are special privileges you have as a child. There is a belonging that you have. And I want to think of, think of the White House, this place that our president lives. You might know that there's some special security there. You want to keep things safe. And so there's restricted airspace above the White House. Don't go flying your drone above the White House. There is a fence around it. And many people throughout the decades have tried to break into the White House and climb that fence and run in. And they don't make it too far because there's uh, secret services there and they, they provide security to the place. And I'm glad they do. But there's a group of kids who were able to get into the White House and they didn't get stopped. No one pushed them out. They're able to get into the White House and they were able to live in that place like it was their own house. They were playing in there, running in there, sliding down the banister. Even stories say that they were able to access the president and wrestle with him, ride on his shoulders, swing from the rafters. And there's people looking saying, how, you know, these, these people plan how to intrude into the White House and they climb the fence and they can't make it any further. But here's these children who make it in. In fact, they brought their animals into the White House. They brought a pony into the White House. They brought this goat that would pull a cart. And stories say that they would even sometimes come in and interrupt an important meeting the president had and they wouldn't be rebuked or sent away. And the difference between the man who hops the fence and runs across the yard and gets tackled and the children who were there playing in the White House is that their father was Abraham Lincoln, president of the United States. See, it makes a difference who our father is. There are certain rights and privileges and opportunities we have just because of who our father is. Maybe you grew up with friends who had rich fathers or opportunities because of the type of work their father did. We have the most privileged position to literally be the children of the heavenly father, creator of the universe. There should be a wonderful sense of belonging that we don't have to intrude. We are welcomed here. We can live out our lives being approved because we are his children. So when it says, look what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, what that tells us is that in the very identity of God, there is a place for us to belong. We are children of God. Now, as I went through that study through every verse in the Bible that has the word Father, um, I noticed that there was not a lot of references to God as Father at the beginning of the Bible. This concept of God as Father is just kind of quiet, and then it gains traction throughout Scripture. But one of the early, earliest places that it shows up is in covenant language. Now, God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. There is covenants he makes in the Old Testament. And we don't really understand the New Testament unless we understand the promises he's made in relationship to us. There's a book I've been reading by Ty Gibson called The Sonship of God. And it traces the covenants that God has made and how he's, there's always been a son of God. There's been a son of God in Adam, a son of God in David, and all the way through so that the son of God, Jesus, came to the very race and line of the other sons of God and redeemed that race. And so the ministry of Christ is in fulfillment of the covenant promises of God. Now you could take and write that same book about the Father, (laughs) the fatherhood of God, because we understand the fatherhood of God through the covenant of God. Here is Father appearing in covenant language with Abraham. Genesis chapter 17, verse 4 and 5. Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, because your name 
but your name shall be Abraham, for you have been made the father of many nations. Literally, Abraham, the word means father of multitudes. And here it says, my covenant is with you. What does that mean? It means part of the covenant of God is that he's covenanted and promised to be a father to his people. He provides a father here in Abraham. So the father role of God is his promise to humanity, his covenant with us. When we think of being his children, we should think of a promise-keeping God who is guaranteeing that we will have a fatherly role as we approach him. That covenant language is continued. You know, they, God was always faithful to the covenant, but the people never were. And so they went into slavery and they come out. And then they want a king. And God didn't want them to have a king, but they get Saul, then they get David, and then they get David's son, Solomon. And this is in 2 Samuel 7, 14. God says to David about his son, Solomon. All right, so this is God speaking to David about Solomon. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So here he is going through the history of his people and saying, in covenant faithfulness, I'm going to be a father to my people. Now, they were unfaithful. God was faithful. And we see the term father appearing a whole lot more when we get to the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Malachi, these, these books bring out the fatherhood of God. And it says in Isaiah 63, 16, For you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. So here we have an acknowledgement, and it's a rare acknowledgement at this point in scripture. You, O Lord, are our father. That's who you are, your father. That's how you're identified to us. Now in Jeremiah 3.19, God actually says to Israel, he's talking about their unfaithfulness to the covenant, and he says, and I thought you would call me my father, and you would not turn away from following me. So Jesus, so God, in the covenant that he's made to man, intended for men to see him as father and them to see themselves as his children, belonging to the father. What an awesome thing that he has covenanted with us to be our father. It says in Psalm 68, 5, he is a father to the fatherless, a protector of widows. God is in his holy habitation. Now, you might be thinking, he's a father, but I don't, I don't know if I belong. Here's the awesome reality of him as father. It's not just for the spiritual elite. It's not a club that he's keeping us out of. Notice that he, who he's a father to. I'll read from a couple of verses. Here's one from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He's not just a father to a certain group. He is father of all. He's over all, through all, and in all, like we read earlier. Galatians 3, this is uh, verse 26 through 28. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God, through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Now there is, is a key phrase here for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. There, there is one way to the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. But in him, everyone is a child of God. It's not just for a spiritual elite. You, if you want him and you come to him through Christ, you are included. You belong. And as we reflect on Father, I just hope there's a, an awesome sense of belonging, that you are at home in God, that he wants you to be with him. And for our final point, I, I want to consider here in, in the fact that we are children is how we become children. You might think, well, he's, is that just a, a metaphor? How am I really his child? How is he my father? There's two ways in scripture that we see that he is our father. And in addition to his covenant faithfulness, we are his children through creation 
and adoption. Now, I am the child of my father through procreation, but I am the child of God through creation and then again through adoption. Here's a couple verses that show that him as our, God as our creator establishes him as our father. Deuteronomy 36 or 26, no, Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Malachi 2.10. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? So the fact that you are created by God means you are a child of God. <laughs> That's an awesome, uh, awesome reality because every one of us is created by God. We are his children. But then he has also done something in addition to creation. He has recreated us. We are born again. And in doing that, he has adopted us to be his. Adoption is a beautiful thing. If you have adopted a child or uh, you were adopted as a child, beautiful thing to say, I'm going to take you and you are going to be my own. And God has done that for us. And many verses portray this beauty of adoption. I'm just going to read one. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then it continues, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, if heirs of God, and fail will heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You are a child of God because he created you. But not just that, he chose you. After we have rebelled against him, he has chosen us and adopted us as his children. So we've looked at the attributes of God, then we looked at the children of God, and now finally I want to look at a resemblance to the Father. Here's our resemblance to the Father. We see this in verse 2 and 3. That there should be, naturally, a resemblance of the child to the father. Verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. So we shall be like him. Verse 3, And therefore, or and everyone who thus hopes in him, purifies himself as he is pure. So a child will be pure as their father is pure because we resemble him. And then the text continues, and it's not part of our text today, but verse 4 through 10, there's this, um, there's this section of scripture that is kind of troubling because it says, if you're a child of God, you should not keep on sinning because your father is not a sinner. He's perfect, and, and therefore the children shouldn't keep on sinning. And there can be a bit of judgment and uh, some guilt as you re read that. There's also an awesome promise in that, because as God's children, we're going to become more and more like him. Now, we can read that through the lens of, of guilt that we're not good enough, or we can read it through the lens of saying, because I am truly his child through creation and adoption, I'm going to grow to resemble my father and I'm going to overcome these things in my life that I don't want in my life. And so we see, we see some of that language in verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So his seed abides in him. That means the DNA of the father is in the child. His seed is in us. And then it says in, in verse 10, by this is it, it is evident who, the, who are the children of God. So here's what makes it evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So once again, we can feel guilt on that or we can say there's a resemblance between father and child and God is love and God is not sin. He's perfect. And I am going to grow to be like that as a child of God. I keep focusing on my father. And that's the type of thing I'm going to see in my life. Such a natural thought that the child resembles a father. I don't look exactly like my father, but there's a whole lot of resemblance. I stand like my father. I put my hand in my pocket like my father. We'll be in a conversation together and we'll say the same exact words at the same exact time because I have grown to resemble my father. In fact, if two people come to you and look nothing alike, 
and one is a father and one is a child, you, you say, no way. He's not the father. You know, it, if, if one is, say, the son is, is large and maybe his skin is dark and his hair is dark and, and the father is this little man and his light skin and light hair, you look and you say, he can't be your father. You don't look alike, right? And that's the, the spiritual case that Scripture is making is that as children of God, we have an awesome privilege of growing to resemble the character of our Father. So it says in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore be imitators of God. Well, that, that sounds really hard. How do I imitate God? And it continues and it says, As beloved children. You can be an imitator of God because you're a child of God. As a child, you will start looking like your father. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. There's a conversation that Jesus has in John chapter 8. And there's a group of people there who say that Abraham is their father. But, God, but Jesus says to them, uh, if Abraham was your father, you would do the things Abraham did. So they're exposed, and, and he exposes them as not really being children of Abraham. So they say, what are you talking about? We have one father, and he's God. So they're trying a, a different approach. God is our father. And, you know, if God were your father, you'd do the things that God does. But then Jesus says to them, your father is the devil, because you do the things the devil does. So we see something about who our father is by the way we live. We can feel guilt on that. Or we can come to our Father and say, I want to look like you. You're beautiful. And I want to resemble the character of my Father. And so those are our three points today. The attributes of the Father. He is a good Father. He is beautiful. He is love. He is a giver. And we see the children of our Father that we have a privileged position of belonging to our Father. And then we see the resemblance of the Father that as we grow to know our Father, we look more like Him. And I hope as you reflect on, on this sermon today, I hope that you feel an awesome admiration for how great God is as our Father, that He just looks so loving and beautiful to you. I hope that you feel a sense of belonging and privilege of being His child. And let's pray together as we close this service. Father in heaven, we are so privileged to be children of God. How great is this love that you've given us, that we could be called your children. I pray that you would help us to resemble you, to love you, to know you more. I thank you that you have promised to be faithful, to be a father to us. And Lord, maybe we're, we're feeling really far and distant, like we don't belong. And I pray that you would just speak to us that we are your children. There is a room for us. You have space for us. Help us to know you as our faithful, loving Father. Lord, we give you our lives today. We're so grateful to grow in relationship with you. And I pray you'd bless this Sabbath day that as we rest in you, we would be able to know you more and enjoy the love you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.